This is the Business Storytelling Show, a top global marketing podcast listened to in more than 100 countries, live streamed on social media, and broadcast on DBTV. Christoph Trapp chats with industry leaders to help your company tell better business stories. Here's today's episode. Hey, 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 business storytellers, Christoph Trapp here, episode 654, how to build a brand identity. Interesting topic to me because there's always a number of different ways to look at that, right? How does the brand sound? How does the band, brand look? And how do you make, how do you push that across all the different touch points? Of course, today that might be harder than ever. Um, so I have an expert on the topic. Rob Meyerson is returning to the show. He was on the show. I didn't look it up hundreds of episodes ago. Talk about how to come up with a brand name. His latest book is now with a sixth edition, Designing Brand Identity. So you can uh, scan that code. We are also live on Amazon. So I just want to point out really quickly, if you're not watching on Amazon, you can always search for Christoph Trapp on Amazon. Go to my storefront, go to the live stream and everything around me. Pretty much, you can see and you can click below and you can buy that fake plant, those uh, sound panels, the microphone, everything. Maybe not that Iowa Hawkeyes helmet, but pretty much everything else is available on Amazon. Where else do we shop nowadays, right? So let's get Rob on the show, find out what's new. Sixth edition, holy cow. I don't think I've gotten to a sixth edition any of my books yet. Certainly, you know, there's always something to update, but what's new in this book? Rob, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Christoph. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I got to say right off the bat, I can't take credit for this being the sixth edition. This book was created 20 years ago by Alina Wheeler. She created five editions before I was involved, and then she invited me to be included for this sixth edition as her co-author. So um, she deserves all the credit, but I'm, I'm happy to be here promoting and talking about the sixth edition. Fantastic. Now, I know in the book, um, you know, it's, it's a very... Um... It's a very, I mean, a lot of content in it. I mean, a big, big book. I got it sitting across the room here from me. Uh, really appreciate you sending a, a copy on over. But what's new in the sixth edition? Why do we have to keep updating it? What is uh, what is something that's uh, top of mind when it comes to Yeah, that? it's a great question. I, I like to think of this book as sort of an encyclopedia of brand and branding. And so like any other sort of reference book, uh, things change and things therefore need to be updated. So some of the obvious things are the trends uh, within branding and even trends outside of branding, but that impact the world of branding. Things like AI, of course, uh, things like social justice. Since the last edition, we've had uh, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement. These are things you might not think of as branding topics, but obviously brands have reacted to these, these movements. Some have reacted in ways that they probably wish they hadn't. Others have uh, responded in ways that that uh, maybe are more, more positive. And so documenting some of that. Um, and then there are also just things like uh, aspects of brand identity coming across virtual reality, for example, that we didn't really have to worry about as much uh, three or five years ago when the last edition came out. Virtual reality. Oh my goodness. Is that still a thing? AI seems to have overtaken all the headlines. So it was virtual reality. Oh, you know what the other thing was? Um, metaverse. Metaverse. Right? Yeah. That me was right metaverses. Before. Yeah. We did not cover that. <laughs> I think we mentioned it once maybe. Um, but yeah, that seems to have uh, fizzled uh, from the news uh, at least. But we do talk about VR and AR augmented reality. And I think with Apple's Vision Pro just having come out, it's it's pretty timely. Um, it's not a huge focus of the book, but we wanted to make sure that we talked about you know, how brands can come across in consistent ways across all kinds of different media. We still talk about some of what you might think of as, as old forms of media. We talk about print, we talk about uh, business cards and things like that. Maybe less of an, uh, of an impact now that we've kind of post pandemic, we're not sharing business cards as often, but we talk about every every way you can think of that a brand identity could be expressed. I, I'm going to go to a conference in the next month or so, and I don't have a business card. I don't even want a business card. I'm not going to hand out any business cards. If people want to stay connected, you know, let's just connect on LinkedIn. Or I guess, I don't know if I can connect with them in the app at the conference. Maybe I can. I'm not, not a vendor or anything at that conference. So um, so who knows? But I don't have I don't even have a business card. I haven't had one in a long in a long, long time. But things certainly change. 
uh, when it comes to um, virtual reality and like the Apple Pro and all those, or whatever it's called, the Apple Vision mm -hmm. Pro or whatever, um, I and I love trying new things. Like, like let's try it. You know sure. what I mean? Like, whatever. But I just haven't gotten into it. I just don't. It's like it's too like shut off from the rest of the world. And I get it. That's part of the pro that's part of the what it's trying to do. Um, maybe, but I just don't really like, I can't get into it. Why is that? Is, I mean, I just an old geezer <laughs> Rob or, um, uh, what's the, uh, I think like any other new technology, there, there are sort of barriers to, to entry and it's going to be more for some people than others. I think what Apple is trying to do, uh, is, is usher in this area of, of much more augmented reality. So you can still see the world around you. You can still interact with people, but you also have the option of having sort of a screen in front of you and, and even having this strange, maybe at first, interaction between digitally created experiences that appear to be happening in the real world and the actual real world. Um, the example we have in the book is a billboard um, created for, uh, I think it's Corona or, or one of their sister beers um, that you can walk up to and just hold your phone up to and you see this 3D image come to life and someone reaches out of the billboard and hands you a beer. So uh, it's just a really cool example of how some of these technologies can be used. That one is without a helmet uh, because we're luckily, I think not all walking around wearing the the, uh, the Apple Vision Pro yet. Some people are, um, but even just with a smartphone, you can create some of these experiences and they can be pretty cool and, and just interesting ways for brands to express themselves that they didn't have access to uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, I've seen people walk around in those Apple glasses or, or whatever. Pretty goofy. And, uh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> it's pretty know. goofy looking. It is kind of goofy, but you know, I mean, I had the Google glasses mm. uh, way back when and I tried those and I thought they were maybe even goofier or, or different kind of yeah. goofy, but, um, but you know, I don't know. I guess it's worth trying, but very interesting. But let's kind of zoom out just a little bit here. And talk about what is a brand identity. Anyways. So we, you know, I've mentioned all the different ways brands can express themselves, and that is my definition of brand identity. It is the cumulative expression of a brand to its target audiences. So that is really everything about the brand. It's it 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 starts with ideas about the brand. So how is the brand positioned? Um, you know, what is the personality? How does the brand feel? But it gets out into the into this sort of extended periphery of all of these different touch points. And then the feeling that you get, the experience that you have from that brand, whether it's something that we all think of like a logo uh, or a website or some of the things we don't think about as much. You know, uh, hotels, a lot of hotels have a signature scent in the lobby. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be visual or, or verbal. It can be other senses. And we, we talk about that in the book as well. Uh, it could be the flavors of different foods. Sometimes those can be proprietary protected as well. Um, so really every single way of experiencing a brand is part of that brand identity. And, you know, when you build one, I mean, your book, I mean, it does focus quite a bit on like the visual aspects, right? This is how it looks. And and I'm I'm still the kind of guy, like I'm not a designer, I'm not, you know, anything like that. And I just like, just put it in the system for me. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like, like we use Restream right now, like just put the brand colors in here, right? We got that very subtle, I can't even point at it right up here, the very subtle brown or whatever that is and the green behind us, if that's even <laughs> green. Those are the brand colors, right? They're just in there, like, they're in there. I don't have to worry about them. Like it's easy. Um, and is that kind of the way to success to make it easy for your creators, for your strategists? Or, or yes, I mean you're you're touching on a few different things. One is uh, I think it's getting easier and easier to create on brand communications across all these different touch points because of the technology we have available. There are a lot of things now where you can say, just snap it to my color palette, put my logo in the corner, and that's sort of the bare minimum of making it quote unquote on brand. Um, but the other thing you're, you're talking about is consistency. And, and so one of the ideals that we cover in the book of, of a great brand is we call it coherence, but you can think of it as consistency. It's this connectedness that you feel across all of the different places. So when people uh, watch this video or go to your website or download something from you, they always have that sense and they don't even need to know where it's coming from necessarily. It, it could be color palette logo, it could be the voice, the tone of voice that you use consistently, but they get that consistent feeling that this is all part of the same sort of family or the same brand. That's part of the identity. The, the tension that we draw in the book with that coherence is flexibility. You also need to be able to flex it a little bit across different touch points. What, what you do on a 
on a, to brand a video is not necessarily the same thing that you would do on a business card or on a website. There, there has to be a, at least a little bit of leeway there. And also you might want to change it over time. You might want to evolve your brand identity uh, over 10 years or, or however long um, so that it feels like this is still the same brand, but it's growing, it's changing, it's keeping with the times. And so we talk about that a little bit about we talk a little bit about that in the book. And that's also, I think, another reason that we have these new editions of the book is just to show fresh examples. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, if you buy a book in 2024, you're not seeing examples of things that happened in, in 2013. Um, it's got fresh examples. There are 800 images, diagrams, uh, visuals in this book, and 75% of them or more are, are new in this edition, just to make sure that we're giving readers the freshest content that we can. We also have 50 case studies in the book and all of those are new. It's a full refresh from, from the fifth edition. And we wanted to make sure if you if you buy two editions, because a lot of people like to have multiple editions of this book, that you're getting all new uh, case studies because some content doesn't change as much. You know, the, the idea of brand strategy and what it is, we're not gonna rewrite that completely because it's, it's still true uh, as it was years ago, but we can put in new examples and case studies. interesting like how things change but also how things kind of right. stay the same quite frankly uh so it's always nice to see when people take the time and update um you know update books and and get us the latest information um you know when you hear branding sometimes i think some companies think of that as oh that's kind of wishy-washy is that important uh, i mean obviously it's important right i mean but why i mean am i just making that up why no, do people it's funny say that and no, sorry, it's, it's, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it, it's funny that you say that because one of the reasons Alina wrote this book uh, 20 years ago is for that exact reason. She was uh, a brand consultant. She was out pitching CEOs and, and uh, teams inside of big organizations and finding that she was getting some pushback on, you know, why does it cost so much to build a brand or what, what's really the point? Is there ROI? What's the process? It's, you know, all of these questions. And so the reason she wrote the book, she said, was it's the book she wished that she had so that she could explain everything succinctly and basically say, look, this is the process. And so the book is, is the second section of the book is, uh, is all the process from start to finish from research down to some of those uh, finer touch points like uniform design and, and things like that, that you might not think of typically. Um, and so she wanted to give people that. She also, the first section is, is just basics or fundamental. She wanted people to have a common vocabulary around brand. What is brand architecture? What does it mean? Um, you know, what, what do we mean by brand identity? You know, these sort of very basic questions. Uh, and so I, I think there's less of that now. It's funny, I started my career in branding around the time Alina's first book came out. So I remember pitching uh, and a lot of it was, what is a brand? Uh, is it important? Should we really invest in it? I feel like now, uh, in my experience, at least, there's a lot less of that. Uh, there's more, to your point, there's more acknowledgement now that brand is important. We kind of get that. Maybe we don't understand the ins and outs of it, but we get it's something we need to invest in. Um, and so now it's a little bit less about that, but um, still getting into the sort of weeds of, pro of the process and what is usability testing? When do you need to do it? What is quantitative versus qualitative research? And what are the pros and cons of those? That's all covered in this book. And uh, those are things that we typically still need to uh, help clients understand. And, and honestly, as a brand consultant, that I need help sometimes. And that's why the book is you know, up on the shelf and you pull it down and you get that quick refresher of how to talk about uh, one of these topics in a way that's intelligent and sort of where to go for more resources to learn more about it. It's always interesting, you know, there's a process and a method to everything, right? And a method and a madness to everything. Um, and people, um, you know, people don't necessarily know how it works or they know um, where the downfalls are. What are some of the things that people think they know about uh, coming up with a brand that they typically get wrong without help? I think uh, it's it's easy for people to jump into what they think is, maybe they think it's the fun part or maybe it's just sort of what they've seen of other brands from the outside looking in. And so they jump to, well, what should we call this company or this product? Um, what should what should the logo be? Let's just get started on a logo. And so a lot of the conversations that we have as, as brand consultants start with, let's go through the process the right way and start with asking these big picture strategic questions of how do we want to position this brand against competition? Let's look at the competition and understand where we can fit in. 
both on a sort of a deeper strategic level of are we are we going to have success in this industry? Do we have something to say that's at all unique, or you know, do we, do we have a role to play in the industry? Down to those more superficial questions, like if everybody in the in the industry has a red circle for a logo, can we stand out by having a blue square or something seemingly kind of silly like that? But but getting that grounding in, you know, what do customers want? Uh, who are we? What do we believe? Why are we here? Uh, and then what does the competitive landscape look like? And sort of slowly, well, hopefully not too slowly, but methodically going through, okay, what does that mean for us strategically as a brand? And then how do we express that consistently uh, across all of these touch points, whether that's a name, a logo, and all these other pieces of the puzzle that we can build? Um, I think that's one of the one of the mistakes I see often is people sort of jump to the end of the process or the middle of the process without really taking the time to do it right. Yeah, it's it's just interesting. You talked about the competitive analysis a little bit, and um, I was when you mentioned that I was thinking about this brand, and I said, "How? T- tell me about your the cult, the 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 look, the colors. Like, what do the colors mean? Like all that stuff. When you really think, when you really put some thought into it, there's a reason why it is what it is, right? And their response was, "Well, nobody else in our industry has that color." <laughs> well, and I was like. So is that a differentiator or is that just like the easy way out? Like you well, tell it's me. funny. There's a, 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 a almost silly, it's gotten almost silly a debate in the branding industry about these words differentiation versus distinctiveness, which to most people are synonyms, um, but there's sort of an academic debate about it. So technically that would be considered having a distinctive brand, just looking different than everybody else. And there certainly is value in that. Differentiation is usually used to mean something a little deeper or more fundamental, like it could be we have a product that literally nobody else has because we've patented it um, versus something more super, superficial like a color. I, I do think having, uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily just go in and pick, okay, nobody has this color, let's use it. Um, there are dangers potentially to using some colors. I'm not big on every color has a specific emotion tied to it or anything like that, but there are, you know, cultures where a certain color may be off-putting or mean something that you didn't intend to mean. Um, there are industries where there, there are some, you know, color in the healthcare industry, you're not going to have a blood red logo, probably, you know, there are mistakes you could make. So thinking about it carefully, um, is, is one thing. And then, you know, I've had a client who literally said the reason our logo is blue is because everyone else is, is blue. They said, we have to fit in. We have to, you know, we have to have a, a logo that looks like X industry so that everyone gets that we're in that industry. And that kind of blew my mind. I, I, there's maybe a kernel of truth in there that you want to make sure that you don't look like you're selling, uh, you know, kids candy when you're in a very mature B2B uh, industry that you're selling to, you know, executives. But generally, it's better, it pays off more to kind of stand out and be distinctive and memorable than to just completely fit in. Yeah, just interesting. I mean, even with some colors, I mean, even red, you know, healthcare or not, I think red is just very aggressive for the, I mean, for the most part. Um, and I, I think that's a proven point. I mean, I'm not the expert on colors, but, you know, if somebody has a red tie, that typically means they're a little <laughs> bit more aggressive and come across yeah. that way than others. Now, who, um, like, who can get the most out of this book? Who should read it? Is it like designers? brand executives, yeah. content strategists, like who, who would it it's be? It's a great question. Uh, like I said, Alina originally wrote it for her clients. So I think anyone working on the client side, meaning you could be on a big brand team at a big company, or you could be a founder or a team of founders of a startup or a small business, um, you'll get a lot out of it because again, that was the original intent. Of course, it's changed quite a bit over the, the six editions. Um, one of the things that's changed is it's really been adopted by the academic community. A lot of professors across the U.S. and across the world have made this the textbook or one of the books used uh, for their students. So another big audience, I think, is whether you're a design student student or a, a marketing or business student, you'll find value in it as well. And then the last group I'd, I'd include is just broadly speaking, brand consultants, uh, people like me who help other businesses uh, create their brands. Um, it's it's not a, I'll say, it's not sort of a, a, a design book for necessarily uh, the most experienced designers that are really looking for um, 
design inspiration from a design guru. It's not a book full of beauty shots necessarily, like full bleed beauty shots of um, of design work. There, there are great books out there by some of the best designers in the world. This book is content rich. There's a, you know, a lot of writing in here about these topics. It covers design, but like I said, it also covers research and, um, and strategy and all of these other different topics. So if you're looking just for something that's sort of like a hundred pages of beautiful shots of pure design work, there's something else out there for you. Of course, we have a lot of nice design in here and all of those case studies, but even the case studies, it's really rigorously kind of documented. What did we do? What was the strategic solution? What were the results? You know, it, it's that level of content. So just to give people kind of an understanding of what they'll get, but I think it, it's effective and useful for any of those three audiences. So check it out and uh, go from there. How, uh, where should building the brand fall into the priorities? I mean, I know sometimes people just want to jump in. Let's say they build a new company and and the company where I work on my, in my day job, I mean, when they launch. So I, I joined them like a month after they launched, you know, but their brand was like, it was <laughs> done. Like, I mean, yeah. that was obviously top of the list, if not number one, top five for sure. Um, and it was defined. This is what it looks like. This is how it talks. This is, I mean, it was right. all done. So obviously they made the choice, you know, it should be pretty early on, but is that where it should fit? And is that how <clears> most <throat> people, when they launch a new company, a new product, how they do that or, or how do they Yeah, good, good company? question. And two questions in there. I think, yes, that is the right way to do it. There's almost never, there's almost no sort of too early to get started on it. Um, it can work really, uh, in tandem and dovetail with your business strategy, um, I do think there are some basic building blocks of a business strategy that you want to have in place before you really start thinking about how you're going to brand it. Um, but honestly, a lot of the brand work that you might do, some of the research that you might do, it could influence the what you think of as more typically the brand or even the product strategy. And so it's nice if you can, if you have the bandwidth, to do those things simultaneously and see if there's some, some uh, cross-pollination there that's useful. Um, so yes, getting that set really, really early is the right way to do it. Your second question was, is that typically how people do it? And that I think is a little more nuanced. Um, there are a lot of uh, startups who feel like let's not invest anything in brand because we're just shooting to exit in three years and get acquired. So who cares what the logo or even what the name of the business is? I mean, I think that's pretty short-sighted because all of this is, it, 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 it operates on sometimes a, on an almost subliminal level, right? A subconscious level, our perception of indus of of organizations and companies is influenced by brand. That's that's what I think the realization has been uh, over the past 20 years that this is this is important and this can really significantly impact the way people interpret uh, what you're selling or who you are. And so even if you're just looking at your audience as potential investors or uh, potential potential acquirers, you still want to put your best foot forward and, and have a great brand. I mean, absolutely. I was just going to say you never know what the opinion of those investors is, right? I mean, if they look at your logo and it looks like I drew it up, you yeah. know, on, on my the, the, the white scratch paper I have, I might turn them away, sure. right? Um, so Rob, really appreciate you coming on the show. Always uh, time flies when you have fun the last 30 seconds here. Tell us who should reach out to you uh, who do you work with? And really appreciate you coming back on the yeah, show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So I still run my my agency, Heirloom, which you can check out at heirloomagency.com. Uh, but for just about anything else, uh, well, I should say the book is available on Amazon now in the US. Uh, overseas, you can pre-order on Amazon. Um, you can go to robmeyerson.com to pretty much learn about everything else that I'm working on. And from there, you can link out to more information about the book, more information about Heirloom, um, and anything else. And feel free to find me on social media and ask me any questions that you have. I'm, I'd be happy to connect on, on LinkedIn or Instagram or, or anywhere else. And thanks so much for having me, Christoph. Thanks for tuning in. Please rate and review the Business Storytelling Show on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.